This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk. The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. Chapter Eight. In Transit. The eighth chapter is exceedingly brief and relates that Gibbons, the amateur naturalist of the district, while lying out on the spacious open downs without a soul within a couple of miles of him, as he thought, and almost dozing, heard close to him the sound of a man coughing, sneezing, and then swearing savagely to himself, and looking, beheld nothing. Yet the voice was indisputable. It continued to swear with that breadth and variety that distinguished the swearing of a cultivated man. It grew to a climax, diminished again, and died away in the distance, going, as it seemed to him, in the direction of Adderdean. It lifted to a spasmodic sneeze, and ended. Gibbons had heard nothing of the morning's occurrences, but the phenomenon was so striking and disturbing that his philosophical tranquillity vanished. He got up hastily, and hurried down the steepness of the hill towards the village as fast as he could go. CHAPTER Nine. Mr. Thomas Marvel You must picture Mr. Thomas Marvel as a person of copious, flexible visage, a nose of cylindrical protrusion, a liquorish, ample, fluctuating mouth, and a beard of bristling eccentricity. His figure inclined to embonpoint, his short limbs accentuated this inclination. He wore a furry silk hat, and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons, apparent at critical points of his costume, marked a man essentially bachelor. Mr. Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside over the down towards Anderdean, about a mile and a half out of Iping. His feet, save for socks of irregular open work, were bare. His big toes were broad, and pricked like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner—he did everything in a leisurely manner—he was contemplating trying on a pair of boots. They were the soundest boots he had come across for a long time, but too large for him, whereas the ones he had were, in dry weather, a very comfortable fit, but too thin-soled for damp. Mr. Thomas Marvel hated roomy shoes, but then he hated damp. He had never properly thought out which he hated most, and it was a pleasant day, and there was nothing better to do. So he put the four shoes in a graceful group on the turf, and looked at them. And seeing them there among the grass, and springing agrimony, it suddenly occurred to him that both pairs were exceedingly ugly to see. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. "'They're boots, anyhow,' said the voice. "'They are charity boots,' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with his head on one side, regarding them distastefully. "'And which is the ugliest pair in this whole blessed universe, I'm darned if I know.' "'Hm,' said the voice. "'I've worn worse. In fact, I've worn none.' but none so audacious ugly, if you'll allow the expression. I've been cadging boots, in particular, for days, because I was sick of them. They're sound enough, of course, but a gentleman on tramp sees such a thundering lot of his boots, and if you'll believe me, I've raised in nothing in the whole blessed country that I try as I would but them. Look at them, and a good country for boots, too, in a general way, but it's just my promiscuous luck. I get my boots in this country ten years or more, and they treat you like this. It's a beast of a country, said the voice, and pigs for people. "'Ain't it?' said Mr. Thomas Marvel. "'Lord, but them boots, it beats it.' He turned his head over to his shoulder at the right, to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to comparisons, and, lo, where the boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. "'Where are you?' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, over his shoulder and coming on all fours. He saw a stretch of empty downs, with the wind swaying and remote green-pointed firs bushes. "'Am I drunk?' said Mr. Marvel. "'Have I had visions? Was I talking to myself? What the—' "'Don't be alarmed,' said a voice. "'None of your ventriloquizing me,' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rising sharply to his feet. "'Where are you?' "'Alarmed, indeed.' "'Don't be alarmed,' repeated the voice. "'You'll be alarmed in a minute, you silly fool,' said Mr. Thomas Marvel. "'Where are ye? Let me get my mark on you.' "'Are ye buried?' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, after an interval. There was no answer. Mr. Thomas Marvel stood bootless and amazed, his jacket nearly thrown off. P. 
peewit, said a peewit, very remote. Peewit, indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. This ain't no time for foolery. The down was desolate, east and west, north and south. The road, with its shallow ditches and white bordering stakes, ran smooth and empty, north and south, and, save for that peewit, the blue sky was empty, too. "'So help me,' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, shuffling his coat onto his shoulders again. "'It's the drink. I might have known.' "'It's not the drink,' said the voice. "'You keep your nerves steady.' "'Ow!' said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. "'It's the drink,' his lips repeated noiselessly. He remained staring about him, rotating slowly backwards. "'We could have swore I heard a voice,' he whispered. "'Of course you did.' "'It's there again.' said Mr. Marvel, closing his eyes and clasping his hand on his brow with a tragic gesture. He was suddenly taken by the collar and shaken violently, and left more dazed than ever. "'Don't be a fool,' said the voice. "'I'm off my bloomin' chump,' said Mr. Marvel. "'It's no good. It's frettin' about them blasted boots. I'm off my blessed bloomin' chump. Or it's spirits.' "'Neither one thing nor the other,' said the voice. "'Listen.' "'Chump,' said Mr. Marvel. One minute, said the voice, penetratingly, tremulous with self-control. Well, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with a strange feeling of having been dug in the chest by a finger. You think I'm just imagination? Just imagination? What else can you be? said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rubbing the back of his neck. Very well, said the voice, in a tone of relief. Then I'm going to throw flints at you until you think differently. But what are you? The voice made no answer. Whiz! came a flint, apparently out of the air, and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Mr. Marvel, turning, saw a flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, then fling at his feet with almost invisible rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Whiz! it came and ricocheted from a bare toe into the ditch. Mr. Thomas Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. Then he started to run tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came head over heels into a sitting position. "'Now,' said the voice, as a third stone curved upward and hung in the air above the tramp, "'am I imagination?' Mr. Marvel, by way of reply, struggled to his feet, and was immediately rolled over again. He lay quiet for a moment. "'If you struggle any more,' said the voice, "'I shall throw the flint at your head.' "'It's a fair do,' said Mr. Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand, and fixing his eye on the third missile. "'I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves, stones talking. Put yourself down. Rot away. I'm done.' The third flint fell. "'It's very simple,' said the voice. "'I'm an invisible man.' "'Tell us something I don't know,' said Mr. Marvel, gasping with pain. "'Where you've hid? How you—' I, "'I don't know. I'm beat.' "'That's all,' said the voice. "'I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand.' "'Anyone could see that. There's no need for you to be so confounded impatient, mister. Now, then, give us a notion. How are you hid?' "'I'm invisible. That's the great point, and what I want you to understand is this.' "'But whereabouts?' interrupted Mr. Marvel. "'Here, six yards in front of you.' "'Oh, come, I ain't blind.' You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I am. Thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Vox et. Oh, what is it? Jabber? Is that it? I'm just a human being. Solid. Needing food and drink. Needing covering, too. But I'm invisible. You see? Invisible. Simple idea. Invisible. What? Real, like? Yes real. "'Let's have a hand of you,' said Marvel. "'If you are real, won't be so darn out of the way like then. "'Lord!' he said. "'How you made me jump, gripping me like that!' He felt the hand that closed round his wrist with his disengaged fingers, and his fingers went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest, and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. "'I'm dashed,' he said. "'If this don't be cock-fighting!' most remarkable. And there I can see a rabbit clean through you half a mile away, not a bit of you visible except— He scrutinised the apparently empty space keenly. "'You haven't been eating bread and cheese?' he asked, holding the invisible arm. "'You're quite right, and it's not quite assimilated into the system.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Marvel. "'Sort of ghostly, though.' 
Of course, all this isn't half wonderful, as you think. It's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. How do you manage it? How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story, and besides— I tell you, the old business fairly beats me, said Mr. Marvel. What I want to say at present is this. I need help. I have come to that. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered, and I saw you. Lord, said Mr. Marvel. I came up behind you, hesitated, went on. Mr. Marvel's expression was eloquent. Then stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. So I turned back and came to you, you, and— Lord, said Mr. Marvel, but I'm all in a tizzy. May I ask, how is it, and what you may be requiring in the way of help? Invisible. I want you to help me get clothes and shelter, and then with other things. I've left them long enough. If you won't, well. But you will. Must. Look here, said Mr. Marvel. I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about any more, and leave me go. I must steady a bit, and you've pretty near broken my toe. It's all so unreasonable. Empty downs, empty sky, nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature, and then comes a voice, a voice out of heaven, and stones, and a fist. Lord! Pull yourself together, said the voice, for you have to do the job I've chosen for you. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were round. "'I've chosen you,' said the voice. "'You are the only man, except some of those fools down there, who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power.' He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. "'But if you betray me,' he said, "'if you fail to do as I direct you,' He paused, and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. "'I don't want to betray you,' said Mr. Marvel, edging away from the direction of the fingers. "'Don't you go a-thinking that, wherever you do. All I want to do is help you. Just tell me what I got to do. Lord! Whatever you want done, that I'm most willing to do.'" CHAPTER X MR. MARVEL'S VISIT TO IPING after the first gusty panic had spent itself, Iping became argumentative. Scepticism suddenly reared its head. Rather nervous scepticism, not at all assured of its back, but scepticism none the less. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man, and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air, or felt the strength of his arm, could be counted on the fingers of two hands. And of those witnesses, Mr. Wadgers was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house, and Jaffers was lying stunned in the parlour of the coach and horses. Great and strange ideas, transcending experience, often have less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Iping was gay with bunting, and everybody was in gala dress. Whit Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon, even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion, and on the supposition that he had gone quite away, and with the sceptics he was already a jest. But people, sceptics and believers alike, were remarkably sociable all that day. Hazeman's Meadow was gay with a tent, in which Mrs. Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea, while, without, the Sunday-school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs. Cuss and Sackbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air, but people for the most part had the sense to conceal whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green, an inclined string, down which, clinging the while to a pulley-swung handle, one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other end, came in for considerable favour among the adolescent as also did the swings and the coconut shies. There was also promenading, and the steam-organ attached to a small roundabout filled the air with a pungent flavour of oil, and with equally pungent music. Members of the club, who had attended church in the morning, were splendid in badges of pink and green, and some of the gayer-minded had adorned their bowler hats with brilliant coloured flowers of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose conceptions of holiday-making were severe, was visible through the jasmine about his window, or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look, poised delicately on a plank supported on two chairs, and whitewashing the ceiling of his front room. 
About four o'clock a stranger entered the village from the direction of the Downs. He was a short, stout person in an extraordinarily shabby top hat, and he appeared to be very much out of breath. His cheeks were alternately limp and tightly puffed. His mottled face was apprehensive, and he moved with a sort of reluctant alacrity. He turned the corner of the church, and directed his way to the coach and horses. Among others, old Fletcher remembers seeing him, and indeed the old gentleman was so struck by his peculiar agitation that he inadvertently allowed a quantity of whitewash to run down the brush into the sleeve of his coat whilst regarding him. This stranger, to the perceptions of the proprietor of the coconut shy, appeared to be talking to himself, and Mr. Huxter remarked the same thing. He stopped at the foot of the coach and horse's steps, and, according to Mr. Huxter, appeared to undergo a severe internal struggle before he could induce himself to enter the house. Finally he marched up the steps, and was seen by Mr. Huxter to turn to the left and open the door of the parlour. Mr. Huxter heard voices from within the room, and from the bar, apprising the man of his error. "'That room's private,' said Hall, and the stranger shut the door clumsily and went into the bar. In the course of a few minutes he reappeared, wiping his lips with the back of his hand with an air of quiet satisfaction that somehow impressed Mr. Huxter as he assumed. He stood looking about him for some moments, and then Mr. Huxter saw him walk in an oddly furtive manner towards the gates of the yard, upon which the parlour window opened. The stranger, after some hesitation, leant against one of the gate-posts, produced a short clay pipe, and prepared to fill it. His fingers trembled while doing so. He lit it clumsily and folded his arms, began to smoke in a languid attitude, an attitude which his occasional glances up the yard altogether belied. All this Mr. Huxter saw over the canisters of the tobacco window, and the singularity of the man's behaviour prompted him to maintain his observation. Presently the stranger stood up abruptly and put his pipe in his pocket. Then he vanished into the yard. Forthwith Mr. Huxter, conceiving he was witness of some petty larceny, leapt around his counter and ran out into the road to intercept the thief. As he did so Mr. Marvel reappeared his hat askew, a big bundle in a blue tablecloth in one hand, and three books tied together, as it proved afterwards, with the vicar's braces, in the other. Directly he saw Huxter he gave a sort of gasp, and turning sharply to the left, began to run. "'Stop, thief!' cried Huxter, and set off after him. Mr. Huxter's sensations were vivid but brief. He saw the man just before him, and spurting briskly for the church corner and the hill road. He saw the village flags and festivities beyond and a face or so turned towards him. He bawled, Stop! again. He had hardly gone ten strides before his shin was caught in some mysterious fashion, and he was no longer running, but flying with inconceivable rapidity through the air. He saw the ground suddenly close to his face. The world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light, and subsequent proceedings interested him no more. End of chapter 10 Recorded in Nottingham, England, on the Ides of March, by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk.